Okay, um, welcome to the, the mathematical colloquium of the math department of Roosevelt University. So today we have uh, the honor and the pleasure for me to introduce uh, Vianney Villamizar. Uh, Vianney, we were classmates back in Venezuela when there was a, a thriving mathematical uh, development there. He left uh, a little bit earlier than I did. Uh, and uh, well, he is an expert in, in numerical analysis and uh, his talk will be, uh, his, the title of the talk is Highly Accurate Absorbing Boundary Conditions for a Particular for, for We have a DNA here. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Wilfredo, uh, for inviting me to this uh, colloquium and to everyone who's connected. Yeah, we are, uh, Wilfredo and I enjoy our freshman years at Universidad Central de Venezuela and became very good friends. And we, we've been friends since then uh, until now. And it's, it's, it's my pleasure to, to present this to people uh, who are related to Wilfredo in this uh, Roosevelt University. Well, let, let me start see. <clears throat> uh, this, this work has to do with uh, wave propagation. And I'm interested in, in studying the boundary value problem for uh, when we have a scattering from an incident wave from certain obstacles. And that has application in acoustic, in electromagnetic, in elasticity, and in deep, many areas. And the idea that I will be discussing today is uh, how to define appropriate absorbing boundary condition when we have an unbounded media. So I have some collaborators listed in here on the, on the <clears throat> left, and Kajat, Acosta, Badge, Rojas, Dastro. Some of them have been my students, others are some collaborators now. And uh, let me begin by giving you the outline. First, I will work on the derivation of this uh, absorbing condition, which is an, a boundary condition for a boundary value problem in a, with application in acoustic scattering. Then I will try to couple those conditions uh, to solve the problem numerically with finite difference and finite element. And, and then I show you some experiments and, and then I will go to <clears throat> uh, multiple acoustic scattering. The, the idea is to start with a single obstacle and then move to uh, multiple obstacles. Okay, so let me now present to you the physical description. It can be understood maybe in this uh, picture here. Uh, assume you have this uh, submarine underwater and then from that boat on the surface, we're sending an incident wave, and then we're starting the reflection from the sumer, we call this the scatter wave. And uh, <clears throat> so what we want to, this is what, it, what we call a direct scattering problem. And what we want to measure is the response from this uh, obstacle underwater, or it might be in the air, you know, and it, in case of elasticity, maybe on the ground too. So, <clears throat> Okay, so see the idea again is, uh, if we reduce this to a 2D, for example, just the cross section, you can see that gamma here is representing uh, the, is representing the boundary of the, of the obstacle. And in this case, this is uh, the shape of the submarine. And the omega is representing the outside region, yeah? the, the steel region to the, obstacle. So the problem is started with this incident wave, which is in this case, is a plane wave propagating in the space or the water or ground. And then the mathematical model is uh, for a time harmonic problem, meaning is uh, the dependence on time is uh, harmonic in time. So it means 
it's kind of a steady state, but it's a, it's, it's a harmonic, right? So in that case, the wave equation reduced to Helmholtz equation, right? So we don't have time here anymore because uh, everything will be depending on this factor, e to the minus i omega t that we can factor out. And at the end, if we wanna compute the evolution in time, we will include that in the computation. And then the conditions are the Ricci condition or Neumann condition at the boundary of the octopus. And that, for example, physically represent the octopus is soft or is hard in the case of acoustic. And in elasticity and electromagnetic may have another interpretation. Finally, the condition at infinity and as, see what I'm working on right now is, a, is the problem in an unbounded domain. So what that means is, uh, assuming this is a submarine, you know, underwater, and then the end is surrounded by all water. So we need a condition at infinity, and that condition is here, which is called the Sommerfeld uh, radiation condition. And uh, it's given as a limit. Now, when, you, when the problem is set up this way, the boundary value problem consists of this pre equation, Helmholtz equation, the condition at the octopus boundary, and the condition at infinity. Um, the problem with this is that numerically, how can we deal with this radiation condition at infinity? Because, uh, of course, we need to have a bounded domain to be able to handle this numerically. So that's why we need to impose some additional condition or change the Sommerfeld condition for something else that we can reduce the problem to a bounded problem. So, and so the idea is, for example, let's assume that we're working on, with this submarine, introduce an artificial boundary, which in this case is a circle around this uh, obstacle. And then we divide the domain, the exterior domain in two pieces. One is a bounded, which is omega minus, and the one outside the circle, which is omega plus, right? So if we do it this way, then we want to replace the Sommerfeld condition, which is given at infinity. Now we want to replace by a condition on this artificial boundary that in my case is the circle in 2D. So what would be an appropriate condition for this uh, artificial boundary that doesn't change the physical properties of the problem. So that, that way it should be an outgoing way with no reflection back. So what actually happened numerically is that there is some reflection, some spur reflection, and we want to minimize this. We want to see what would be an appropriate condition for this reflection to be uh, not disturbing, you know, the whole solution much. Okay, so, <clears throat> Uh, the challenges are, as I said, you know, uh, to have this condition with a minimum spurious reflection. And uh, I plan to use finite element and finite different methods in the interior of the domain. And, <clears throat> so, and the computational goals now are, yeah, there is, see, we, we, would, we would like to have an overall high order and highly accurate numerical method. So, so we, for that, we would like to have uh, a high order numerical technique in the interior. So that's gonna be, in my case, gonna be finite different or finite element. And also we would like to have this uh, absorbing condition to be a high order absorbing condition. So what I mean is, Coupling these two high order conditions, we will have an overall high order technique. And that, that's the goal, right? And uh, also we would like this computational domain to be relatively small because uh, remember, this is an infinite problem, right? Unbounded domain. So the question is, if, if I'm able to reduce this infinite domain to a small domain, the computational domain, uh, as long as I can do this, smaller and smaller, then the computational cost would be also low. And that's, that's what we're looking at, right? And also we would like to have this 
uh, to have an, a relatively easy implementation so people can use it, right? Okay, so, so those are the goals. Now, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, what we would like to do is to replace this summer fake condition with another one which is uh, appropriate for the, our, our idea to have a truncated domain. And see, the first idea that people use it when they face this uh, problem was to just consider the operator. You know, the, this is the summer fail operator. Just consider that as, as the absorbing condition on that artificial boundary. So, what I mean is, instead of using the limit, which is a I mean, it's, it's going to be, of course, at infinity because we're imposing a condition on the on the bounded domain. We just will say, okay, let's say this is the condition in that artificial boundary. But of course, we're making a, an error here because this is only valid at infinity, and then we're imposing this now in in a, in a finite radius from the obstacle. So, one we can actually measure that error by doing this, and I'm gonna show you through this theorem. See, this is called uh, Wilcox theorem and was uh, proved in 1955. And what he shows is that Helmholtz equation satisfying, so if you satisfy Helmholtz equation and also satisfy this Sommerfeld condition at infinity, outside a circle, in the, or in this case, it's an sphere in 3D, circle in 2D or a sphere in 3D, then um, the solution outside that sphere can be represented exactly like this. So, so what I mean is, see, it, here is the obstacle, here is the sphere. So outside this region here, the solution has this infinite series representation. And this is a very powerful theorem. I mean, we still don't know the solution exactly, but at least we know the explicit dependence on the radius r. We don't know this coefficient function that depends on the angles theta and phi in 3D, right? That's, those are unknowns, but I know the dependence on the radius is, 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 um, is well defined in this case, right? So the interesting part here is that this infinite series converge uniformly it's absolutely convergent and there can be differentiated term by term. Okay, so this is the idea now. Um, okay, but besides that, those angular coefficients that are unknowns, right? They satisfy this recursion formula. And uh, so, so then we have the infinite series representation and we have a recursion formula that would allow us to compute those coefficients if we know the previous one, right? Okay, so, so let me keep going now and show you how can we use it, you know? See, for example, if we apply the Sommer fail operator to this infinite series, then the first two terms, see this, this series go, let's say L0 and L1, those two terms cancel out. And then the dominant term becomes the third term, which is order one over R squared. So in other words, see, if we wanna measure the error we make by applying some fail condition, then it depends how far is that circle or that sphere from the from the obstacle, right? So what is the radius of this sphere or this? So if we wanna get a very precise result, then we need to go really far away, right? For this error to be small. And, and that was what people did at the beginning, right? So people just satisfied with this and they tried to compute in a large domain and to get an approximation or a this uh, boundary value problem for Helmholtz equation that represents the, the pressure wave, for example, right? Now, what people did later, see that, that became like the way to go in the early 60s, 70s, you know, 1970s. But later on, people say in the early 80s, say, well, why don't we get a more, um, uh, a higher order operator? So what it means is, see, here is the Sommerfeld, 
And then if we add one more term, for example, to this boundary condition, you are, see, this is more like a roaming condition, right? You have here the derivative of u and u, right? But now we're adding this extra term and that if you apply this operator to this infinite series, then you're able to eliminate the first three terms. So that's what we call an annihilating operator, right? Because it's annihilating the first two and three terms, and then the approximation will become order one over R3. If we keep doing this, see, and the, actually people find ways to do that, you know, and this is a famous paper by Bailey's Gumbers and Turkel. This paper nowadays has 801 citations in Google Scholar, and it's in 1982. What they did is they found a way to define this separate, this, this uh, uh, boundary operators uh, recursively. So, so then this is the B1, the B2, it's going to be this one here. See, look at this, it's now more complicated. But that will give me an order one over R5. So, so what it means is now you can bring this artificial boundary closer and have a rather good error, right? Let's say that way. Now, if we want to go higher, you know, more than uh, this approximation order one over R to the five, then this operator will be more complicated here. See, now we have second order derivative in the radius. But if we want to go higher, then we need third order, fourth order. So, so then the boundary condition will become more complicated than the actual Helmholtz equation, right? So that's why this was OK, but was not practical if we want to go high, higher order, right? And uh, so that's why people start working on this and say, well, we need to get something better than this. You know? And uh, so, so see, because that, that was the, what the, they did is they, in, they used this condition for, for as I said, this would gonna, gonna give me order one over R squared, that summer fail, and that one would be a little bit better, right? And so forth, right? But then, uh, If I want to discuss a little bit of the history, you see that was people did in the 70s, use just Sommerfeld in the early 80s and 70s. Then this idea came from Bailey Turkel, but many other researchers, Enquis Maida and Chris Mann and Higdon, several of those uh, introduced or construct uh, higher order condition, but only until degree, uh, let's say, until until the second derivative because then it became too complicated, you know. For then in the late '80s and in mid '90s, this guy Givoli grow they develop at exact conditions. So what it means is they were able to develop a condition that represent the solution exactly outside that sphere or that circle, and that was the idea was to use kind of a um, a expansion by eigenfunctions because the solution for the sphere and the circle is known. So it was kind of a based on elementary PDE solution using separation of variables or so forth. And but the problem with that is it it, it after the problem is reduced uh, is discretized it reduced to a linear system of equation and that linear system of equation is dense along the boundary because you need to integrate along the whole boundary. So then the people decided, no, that's, let's, let's work out a different idea. And then it came this guy, Beringer, a French uh, researcher who, who the, constructed this uh, very popular band, absorbing boundary condition called PML, perfectly matched layer in, the, in 94. And that became a very powerful and very practical to use. And, and an alternative to this is in the mid 90s, people start working in the high order local ABC. So, so this local means that contrary to the, to the number three, is no longer dense along the boundary, but it's only including only, only few points in the computation. And that makes the computation much uh, convenient in terms of computational cost than the number three. Okay, so to give you a little bit more of the importance of this, see, 
look at uh, what people did. Uh, I mean, what is the impact that those uh, 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 results had? You know, for example, Bailey's Turkel, that that condition that I mentioned to you, have been cited, you know, 960 times, and that was maybe in 2014 or something. And that then the second paper, 580. But if you go, I mean, I, I was looking at this in time, so recently, maybe two or three years ago, and then I found that that first paper now has at more than a thousand citations, and the second one for Bailey's has a seven city. And if you look at the other guys, see, for example, uh, let me see, uh, Keller Givori, those are the ones who introduced the uh, Richard to Norman, which is an, an exact condition. See, in the 2014, 2015, they have 677, this has 76A. But look at Berenger. Berenger is the PML, it has more than 8,000. And that was maybe, as I said, seven or eight years ago. But when I look at this recently, maybe two, three years ago, now look at the citations are also a thousand for Givoli. And look at Veringer, he has 12,000 citations in a single paper. So that gives you the idea the importance this condition has in application. Because this PML, for example, the, the Beringer condition, uh, is used in acoustic, electromagnetic, water waste, elasticity in almost any wave propagation where you need to truncate the domain. So, so this is, and that's what we're interested in, see what we can do that improve, you know, or make more practical uh, the use of this condition. So, so our question was, when we started this research, how can we increase the order of the approximation without increasing the complexity of this absorbing condition? Okay, and this is the answer here. Let, let's take it. So the answer is, well, you know, the problem at the boundary uh, from the Bailey's and Turkel approach is that they have high order derivatives and if they want to improve, they need to, those operators become higher order uh, every time you try to increase the order. Well, one easy way to avoid that is to, instead of defining the interface condition as a for by those differential operators, we can define this. Uh, we just say, well, the 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 field inside or the, the the in this case this is the pressure wave, for example, the pressure U inside the computational domain is gonna be equal to the pressure wave outside the computational domain, and we know how that can be represented because this is Wilcox theorem, right? So, so we know how the solution is represented outside. We don't know inside because that's the part of the, that's where we will perform the numerical work, but we know how it is outside. So, so then a natural condition to impose would be, okay, you at inside is gonna be you plus outside. But, but then by doing this, we are, we're introducing more unknowns into the system because all these FL are unknown too, right? And we have we have already two unknown here. We, we don't know u minus and we don't know u u plus, right? So so what we need to do is we need at least two more conditions, right? For to to the to for the problem to be um, well, well defined, right? So let, let me show you how that works. So as I said, that's gonna be my condition or my first. Uh, equation for that absorbing condition. My second equation is going to be just the continuity of the first derivative at that interface. Those two conditions are typical in interface problem, right? So, so we normally ask for the continuity of the, 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 the U and the continuity of the normal derivative, right? So those are the main uh, two conditions for interface problem. But we have also this angular function that we still don't have an additional condition for them. And why we need it? See, let me show you why. Because see here, if I only have one term in the, in the expansion, let's say it's only, my expansion is truncated only one term. 
So how many unknowns do I have? Well, I have one here, U minus, and I had this F0. So I had two unknowns. So, and then I have two equations, so that's fine. I'm perfectly fine with one term. But once I start adding terms, like in this case, see, now I have until L minus one, so I'm adding many more terms. So I need many more equations, right? So, and those equations are gonna be provided by, let me see here, the recursion formulas, look at this. So this is giving me a condition for all the FL in terms of the FL minus one. So every time I add one term, I'm adding also one more recursion formula. So in other words, the condition that we're defining here, Okay, this is the condition. My absorbing, I'm replacing Sommerfeld condition, which is, do you remember the one with the limit at infinity? I'm replacing Sommerfeld condition by these three conditions here, or three equations, uh, that are satisfied at that absorbing boundary. In that particular case, it's an sphere, right? So, so that's what we're doing here. And, uh, and now, I want to show you that similar work can be done in 2D. And normally, in differential equation, in PDs in particular, when we go from 2D to 3D, it's more complicated. But in this case, it's reverse. So 3D is kind of a direct, direct uh, derivation for us. But when we go to 2D, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to show you why, see? Because in 2D, <clears throat> In 2D, we have this uh, infinite series representation, the same thing, right? So, so if we have U satisfying Helmholtz equation and the Sommerfeld condition in 2D, then that outgoing way outside that circle can be represented by this infinite series, but this infinite series has two families of unknowns, F and G, right? So, so now we don't, we're, not, we're facing another additional problem is that we not only need uh, uh, the two condition, the two continuity interface condition plus the recursion formula, but we also need an additional condition and then two recursion formulas. And, and that's what we do here, see. See, we have, we have two recursion formulas, the theorem provide this, the CARP theorem, provide the two recursion formula and also the representation at infinity or outside the circle. But also, sorry. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, so, so here we go. See, we, we do the same thing. We say, okay, one of the equations is gonna be the continuity of U across the interface, right? So U minus, which is the one we will get Computation with computational work. And the U plus, we have a semi analytical representation where we don't know the F and the G, right? So we don't know those, right? Okay, so we, as I said, we need more equation now. And these are going to be, again, continuity of U, continuity of the normal derivative. So those are the, uh, the typical interface condition, but also. Uh, we need an additional condition because now we have two families. So if I only work out the first term, I need I need one. I have one, two, three. So I need three conditions, right? And this is the the one we we decided to include here is that we adding more regularity to the solution, asking for the second derivative also to be continuous. And this has a, a justification in in the that. Uh, Normally in this problem, the, summer, the Helmholtz equation has solutions that are, uh, has um, uh, that kind of regularity. Okay, so if we go to the uh, counting all the unknowns again, we have for every one, every trend that we add to the two, to the two infinite series, we need an additional two conditions and those are given by the recursion formula for F and G. So in other words, in 2D, this is the condition now that is replacing Sommerfeld. So 
basically is asking regularity the U at the absorbing boundary plus the two recursion formulas. Okay, and now we're ready for the numerical work because this is the modeling, this is the modeling part where we construct those conditions. And now we want to show that they actually uh, accurate and they give me the order that uh, we were looking for, right? The high order condition. Okay, so so let me now, uh, well, this is a detail that I can, oh, let, let me go to this. See, as I mentioned at the beginning, the idea is to use in the interior um, two different techniques. One is a finite element and the other one finite difference. With a finite element, we can go high order easily and also be able to handle complex geometries. With finite difference, uh, it's not that easy to go high order, but we can actually, uh, in the implementation is simple. And, uh, and we, we can still can do complex geometries too. So, so then we, we, do, we do it the two ways, right? But I wanna discuss now this high order method because I, what I wanna show you is that we can actually get high accuracy and also high order of convergence. What I mean by high order of convergence is that when I refine the grid, the error is, uh, improves according to that uh, refining. And, and that's, that makes the method more attractive, right? From a computational point of view. So see what uh, the finite element that we're trying to use here is called isogeometric, finite element isogeometric, which is uh, defined in terms of uh, B splines basis. So, so we're not using just a regular Lagrange basis for the finite element representation, but using NERS. And this has an advantage that, that the norms represent exactly many surfaces and, and, and parametric curves. And not only that, it allows us to use the same basis, not only describing the geometry of the obstacle, but also in the interior of the domain, which is not possible using just regular finite element. So, so that's uh, one of the ideas here. So, yeah. Trying to know this. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, hi, this is how we perform the analysis. Let me pass this. Okay. So, for example, see, let me show you in 2D. If we have a circle, and for a circle, we have an exact solution to compare with. So, if we have an incident way coming this way here, right? And you see, you see the scattering back in here. This is the shadow zone right there. And this is for a Dirichlet problem. And you see the approximation using this finite element, using basis degree two. So these north B splines are degree two. It's just kind of a rational function. And if you look in here, see the order approximation is basically three. And that's what is expected because according to the theory, if, if I'm using polynomials degree P, my expectation is to have an order of convergence to P plus one. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. But even more interesting than that, you look at the approximation. See the approximation to this, using this numerical technique and using this absorbing condition uh, at the boundary, at the absorbing boundary is uh, very precise. See, look at this, is it 10 to minus five? That's the approximation of this numerical solution to the exact solution. See, 10 to minus is when we refine a little bit more, you know? And this is not really a very refined grid. It's kind of a coarse grid. And, and if we increase the degree of the polynomial to three, see, look at that. Then we have P plus one gives me four order of convergence. And, and then in terms of the accuracy, see, we're really getting a much better error right now or the 10 to minus seven with this. And we can go even to polynomial degree four, right? And look at this, they were getting five here, right? And the approximation is now in the order of 10 to minus, which is in single precision is a machine precision, you know, if you look at that way. So, so this is really, um, and this is only using, look at this, 11 terms. 11 terms in this, in this absorbing condition for the expansion. See the carp expansion, 
this is in 2D, is using only 11 turns to get this precision of 10 to minus A uh, of overall, right? In, and this is actually at the artificial boundary. This is the error at the artificial boundary. But this is the error actually overall in the whole domain. Okay, so so with this, you know, I, I think I give you I gave you a flavor. What what is the importance and what is the um, um, benefit of using this condition or introducing this condition in the computation? Now, what I have shown you is only for one single obstacle, right? But in in, in practice, you know, in in the real world. We, when we have when we are sending an incident way to explore some problem in elasticity electromagnetic or acoustic we have more than one scatter so suppose we have like in this case many scatter like five three whatever right then the problem becomes more complicated now right and what people did at the beginning is enclose all the ma these many obstacles by a circle into the or an sphere 3d and then you proceed similar to what we did already. I mean, using imposing condition here, here and there, you know, Dritchin, Neumann, Robin, whatever is necessary. And that's that's what I mean. Act, what we actually did that, you know, and that see the, the equation would be basically the same: Helmholtz, Dritchin, or Neumann. But now this gamma and omega are the domains outside. The, it's the intersection of all the domains of all these. And the gamma is the joining all these uh, the boundaries, right, uh, the, the, of the obstacle. So, so that's what we did, you know, back in 29, 2009, is that we enclosed all these many obstacles in a big circle, and then we just do the same thing we did with a single scatter. But this happens to be very expensive computation. As you see, the domain is very large. And if those obstacles are well separated, it's even worse, right? So you need to enclose this by a large, uh, and then it would be computationally expensive. Okay, so then the idea is what, what we can do to reduce the domain, you know, to make it more. Uh, so, so one idea came from some people that uh, we, we adapted the idea is to enclose every obstacle by a circle. So suppose we had this submarine and two wells. So in closing the two wells, I mean, assuming they're separated, right? So by, by circles. And then we, we will perform the computational work inside here. And outside there, we will use those expansion representing the solution outside those circles. But now the problem is more complicated because this obstacle is affecting this one, and this also is affecting this one. So, so in this case, we not only have the incident wave, but we have all the wave coming from the other scatter. So, so the problem becomes very complicated now, right? Because, I mean, how how can we manage to handle this all this reflection from different obstacles back and forth, right? Because this is affecting this, but this is also affecting this one here. Okay, so so then. <clears throat> Uh, th this is what we what we will do now. Okay, we will call U1 the representation of the solution outside this circle for the submarine. And then U2 for the for this second well, and U3 for this is only outside, right? And it's, we can show, and it's actually, we actually prove it in a in a theorem in one of those papers that. The, sol the solution U, I mean, the, the scatter way can be represented in the summation of this UI, you know? So in other words, the scatter way in the domain omega plus, which is exterior to all these many computational region, is the, so is can be, because this, this, remember, this problem is so linear, right? So it can be superimposed all these, um, scatter away from each individual scatter. And this is what I, what I show you here, see. This is the scatter away in this particular case represented as a summation of this U1, U2, and U3. Perfect. And, and, and now what? Well, we need to, we need to um, define the condition for the multiple scattering. And this is what we did here, see. Let me show you. 
Okay. So, so, so here's the idea. As, as I say, a little bit more complicated, but I think with the background that we have already for the single scattering, we may be able to see how to go now. See, saying that, for example, this condition is U minus, so the computational, um, the, yeah, the numerical solution inside those, right? So this is U minus, or should be equal to U plus outside, but now U plus is the summation of the U1, U2, and U3, right? So, so this is this condition here. So thinking this as U minus, and this is the summation U, U, U plus. Now those UM are given by carp expansion. So every one of these is given by this for formula outside the corresponding uh, artificial boundary, right? So, so that will be my first equation. My second equation is that the normal derivative again, see the interface condition, is the summation of the normal derivative of each one of these outgoing ways, right? And then we have the second, the, the condition for the second derivative that reduced to a special operator here that is, is a, is, is, is a, it's a technical detail how to get there, but it's playing also in our papers. And then, we have the two recursion formulas, uh, but now we have recursion formula for every single uh, representation. So for every single of this carp expansion, right? So as I said, imagine the single scattering problem, but now not only the incident way is affecting the problem, but all the reflection back and forth from the other obstacle needs to be taken, in, taken care. So this condition with this, with the Helmholtz condition C. Now the Helmholtz equation for each one of these obstacles, and so or, or not for each one, the Helmholtz equation in the whole domain, and then the the boundary condition on each obstacle, that, and then here is the absorbing condition, where is the where the couple of the C. In this case, you can decompose this and this completely independent, but when when you go to here is where they couple, because every way from one octagon to another is affecting uh, each octagon, right? Okay, I hope I give you an idea. See, it's kind of complicated to, to see the, all the detail here, but the idea is that uh, we need to take into account now all the interaction between the different scatterers. And, and this is kind of the extension of this single scattering absorbing boundary condition to the case of multiple scattering. Now, let me show you some results now for this in homogeneous media and heterogeneous media. See, this is, for example, in homo by homogeneous media, what I mean is the properties of the media is the same here and there, right? So it's the same, same condition here and inside, the properties doesn't change, right? So then, for example, see, look at this. This is a com com complicated uh, configuration. If we had this circle here, there, there, you know, those different geometries, different, different. Then I use different uh, radius for my absorbing condition, for my artificial boundary, you know. And then in this case, the waves come in this way here, right? You know, this is my incident way. So this problem has an exact solution. See, every time we have circles or a sphere, um, people have worked out, you know, in, in the past, uh, exact solution using either uh, eigenfunction expansion or Laplace, there are different ways to get those. Not easy either because when you have many obstacles, same problem happen that you have to consider the interaction of, among them. But anyhow, so there is an exact solution to compare with here. And as you see here, see, in this particular case, we're using a finely different second order, right? So, and you see here the second order clearly established the errors are not as good as the one we saw before because this is a low order in the interior. Although we have a high order absorbing condition, the order for the whole technique is dropped by the method in the interior, right? So that's why then we, we did, we, we're working, we're actually submitting a paper now where we have 
high order in the interior and high order absorbing conditions. So to improve this, uh, this order of convergence and this approximation. Okay, but let me show you another one. See, or, or um, uh, this, this graph here, what I pretend with this is to show you the advantage, uh, the computational advantage of using what we do in this uh, far field expansion uh, absorbing boundary condition compared with a DTN, which is one of those that I discussed at the beginning, which is an exact absorbing condition that I mentioned to you in the 90s or, you know, that people use it and, and they use it a lot. But the problem is, see, this is a uh, description of the metrics. Those are dense block and those occur at the boundary because we're integrating. In this case, we only have points, you see, and that represents a big savings in terms of computational costs. As you see here, the non-zero terms is 72,000 for this example that we have here. In here, we have 167,000. So, so there's a big saving by going from uh, a condition that includes all points on the boundary instead of one that includes only a few points. You know? And that's exactly the what we want to highlight with this technique. You know? Okay, so so here here we have, <clears throat> for example, in the case of the submarine, see if we have the incident wave coming this way, right? This is the answer if for a single scattering. But then if we have the single scattering, now we have multiple scattering. We have the two wells. Now you see the response how it goes. You know, you see. This is what we expect quite the, from a qualitative point of view. That's exactly what we expect. And the approximation here is also in that order of second order. Okay, well, I want to show you a simulation, but I probably don't have time now. Let me just uh, finish with this uh, discussion. See, we did the same thing for the heterogeneous media. So meaning now that this, this dark blue region is where the properties are different than the more uh, uh, not uh, dark region outside here. Same thing here, different than here. And now if we study the scattered way from those, uh, this is what we will see. See, in this case, the way is coming this way, you know? And, and that's, that's the answer. Now, how the, how the approximation looks like in here, see, we don't have an exact solution to compare with, but we, we can have a, like, we can create like a reference solution that is, is, is obtained by refining the grid uh, much more than what we see here. So this is 60 PPW, but we can go to 200 PPW with L15 or maybe larger and compare against this. And this is what we get. So you get the second order, which is what we expect to see. And this is the, the accuracy, you know, for this approximation. Okay. so. In conclusion, see, let me let me just uh, give you some summary of what, what uh, <clears throat> we have done is we had constructed a high order local far field expansion for both single and multiple scattering. We have also derived an overall high order and highly accurate numerical method for see we, we not only have a high order absorbing condition, but we have an overall high order method. And then that's something that I didn't show you, but is that these uh, absorbing boundary conditions are well uh, are well suited to to study also high frequency problem. And uh, and then um, yeah, we have shown also that we have we can have a low computational cost for multiple acoustic scattering in homogeneous and in heterogeneous media. Okay, see, now what we're doing right now, or what we've been doing well actually for, for several years now, is trying to extend those ideas, right, in different directions. For example, see, we, we're now about to submit a paper using uh, an overall high order and highly accurate condition for multiple scattering, right? So what I show you today is only second order for multiple scattering, but we we, this is already done for high order also, and it's something that we expect to submit soon. 
Also, we had this for elastic scattering, see, which is more complicated because elasticity, you know, <laughs> is represented by a vector <laughs> right? So, so the, the U is not, a, it's not a, longer a scalar function, but it's a vector function. So, so it requires a little bit more of the, uh, work with the different ways because we have transfer way, we have longitudinal way. So it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated. And this is also, I, I did it with one of my students, Anotilo Roja, who's one of the attendants of this uh, conference today. We were able to get this uh, work in 2D and we're actually working right now in 3D for this problem. Okay, the other extension that I'm working on right now is is extending this to the time dependent wave equation. We, we, have, we have done this for Helmholtz equation, but we can do for the time dependent, of course, it's gonna be a different expansion, but uh, we already had that also. And it's, we're writing this paper to be submitted soon too. So, so that's kind of the thing I, I'm interested in, in working on, and I've been working uh, for some time now. See, in, and, and the future work, I'm sorry, as a future work, I'm thinking in uh, work, see, my, our technique right now is limited to only circuits and sphere because that's where we have the representation. But we're trying to see how general we can be in defining a different shape for these uh, artificial boundaries. And also uh, in, an important extension would be to, to bring this to electromagnetic way because so far we have acoustic and elasticity but uh, electromagnetic will be of very much interest, you know, to people. Okay, so, so that's what I wanted to present and thank you for being patient there and, and listening to my talk. <clears throat> well, thank you, Vianney, for that interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Uh, I have a question about the recurrence of the coefficient, the F coefficients. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so let's the, the initial to, one, you know, the, the, the one that depends on theta and phi. Uh -huh. Yeah, let, let's do the first one, right? Yeah, let's go here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. He will cause, yeah. yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, the, my question is the, the the this is the the Laplacian. I mean, is it, these are you you need to assume regularity on the on those coefficients to to make sense of of derivatives right. there, right? Yeah. Exactly. See, because this is a here is the Beltrami operator, so it's kind of a in the in the Laplace, right? So in, in the Laplace operator. So let me let me write this down here. Yeah, yeah. This this one here is a is a second derivative on the two angles, right? So we 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 have, we have terms like that in this. this term. So yeah, they they need to be at least uh, C two in this case, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> see, uh, another thing is see for this to work. When we discretize the domain and we need to, another additional problem is uh, obtaining a, a nice grid, you know, a, a nice grid in terms of smoothness. So, because even, even though this could be, I mean, a, a high order, uh, I mean, be, be certain regular, if the, if the grid isn't, then we, we, we may lose this, uh, approximation because the grid, you know? So so uh, something that I didn't discuss today is that we need to generate grids which are um, uh, with are in accord in a, with somehow have the same properties of the functions that we are solving for, for the solution we're looking at, you know? Any other question or comment? Well, if not, thank you, Mr. the speaker again. And uh, well, again, thank you very much, Vianney. It's a 
very updated talk and uh, well i hope that all the future work that you are doing will you will be finished you will finish soon so here at the department someone well has he works but in the realistic point of view i mean but you know they he treat also uh obstacles but you know it's from 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 probably front of you so i don't know if uh, he has he want to make any comment or or observation but in any case uh, is is very interesting yeah okay thank that's you. it thank you very much uh for attending and uh well see you around <laughs> sometime thank Thank you, okay. Rafael. Thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.